Good morning, church. Man, it is good to be with you this morning. I believe that God is going to speak in a powerful way. And I'm fired up. Are you fired up? All right, I hope so. I am fired up about this topic. What we're going to talk about today, one of my favorite things to talk about, and that's purpose. I believe that once you grasp your purpose, you understand that God created you with a plan and a purpose that he has big things in store for your life. If you get that, then you'll never be the same. And we kicked off this series last week talking about this idea of purpose. Mike asked the question that we should all ask, what are we going to be willing to do for God? When we stand before him at the end of time, are we going to be able to tell God we left it all on the field and we did everything we could for him? And that's what we got to answer for ourselves. Then we also talked about the idea that when you know your purpose, remember Mike had this little wooden thing uh, that you didn't know what it was. He's like, you couldn't use it correctly unless you knew its purpose. The idea is that once we know our purpose, once we identify it, then we're able to avoid some of life's pitfalls and temptations and stay where God wants us to go. But you have to know your purpose. And then maybe the biggest thing that came out of the last week was the idea that we are called to do greater things. Everybody say greater. greater. Yeah, greater things. You know that Jesus said that we would do greater things than him. He told his disciples. We looked at this passage last week. He told his disciples, you will do greater things than I have. Why? Because we have access to the Holy Spirit. If you know Jesus, the Holy Spirit is inside of you. And that's power that's inside of us. So we could do greater things. And we tap into that. Then we are going to change the world around us. Let's write this in on your outline before we really dive in. Number one, the reminder. God has greater things in store for you. Greater things in store for you. Now today, uh, what I want to talk about, where I want to start. Well, not start where we're going to stay. And I'm fired up about this. As I want to talk about seeds. You know, like seeds that you plant in the garden. You fired up about seeds? I, I, come on. Are you fired up about seeds? So some of you are fired up. The rest of you are like, that's not all that cool. There's not that much to be fired up about when it comes to seeds, right? Come on. Have you heard the radio station or the radio commercial when you're driving? North Dayton. North Dayton. North Dayton Garden Center. Come on, that's rock and roll, man. You can't get fired up about that. Yeah, that's about as punk rock as uh, Wild Birds Unlimited. The magical way of bringing people together. I don't even know how it goes. Now, it's hard to get a little fired up about seeds, really, but I think we're going to get there this morning. I was talking to Tim a couple years ago. Tim, he does a landscape business or lawn care business, landscape business, and I was talking to him about my lawn and my grass. And I was trying to ask, you know, how, what can I do to help it look better than it does? And he's like, well, you got to get the right kind of seed. And he got real excited. He got real fired up. And he's like, well, this kind of seed, this will work with this kind of water. Or in this season, if you want to do a different kind of grass, you can use this kind of seed. This seed's awesome. And I'm like, dude, chill out. It's just grass seed. He's like, no, no, no. It's awesome. He was really fired up about the grass seed. He's like, you want a great lawn? It's all about the seed. Say, it's all about the seed. So what we're going to talk about this morning, it's all about the seed, but it's all about what God wants to do in each and every one of us, and I believe we're going to get fired up about it. Before we go any further, though, I want to pray. All right, let's bow our heads, close our eyes, let's pray that God would speak. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would speak in a powerful way this morning, that you would get me out of the way so that you can show up, you can challenge our hearts, no matter where we are in this spiritual journey, will you help us see what the next step you're calling us to is God, make your word come alive. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. I want to talk about Mark chapter 4. The the gospel of Mark, it tells the story of Jesus. In chapter 4, it tells the story of Jesus telling three stories, three parables. And all of these parables, all of these stories had to do with seeds, had to do with planting. Now, if you've been to church for some length of time, you maybe have heard these or some of these before. The first story is about a farmer who goes out and he scattered seeds. And some of the seeds fall on good soil and they grow into a good plant. And then some seeds fall onto rocky soil or the path and they can't produce a root and the, the plant dies. And then some seeds fall into soil, but there's weeds there. And if the plant grows, the weeds choke the plant. And it was all this idea of when we grow spiritually, our faith grows up, there's lots of things that can kind of take our life, but we ultimately have a responsibility to till the soil. You know you can affect the soil in your life? I hope so. 
God wants us to do, or God wants to do a work in us, but we got to work the soil a little bit. The last analogy that Jesus uses is about a mustard seed. He talks about a mustard seed, which is one of the smallest seeds in all of the plant kingdom. I don't know how he says that, but plant dumb. And yeah, but it grows into one of the biggest plants. This idea of just a little bit of faith can grow and multiply, and God does a work. And right in the middle, this is the one I want to talk about. This is the, the story he tells. Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 24. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. You reap what you yeah, yeah, that's what that's saying there. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. He also said this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scattered seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he doesn't know how. Now, let me just pause right there because we live in a day and age where we understand how plants work, right? I'm going to talk about how they work a little bit, but if you did third grade biology, you probably know how plants work. Well, in this day and age, they didn't know all the scientific details, and so there's a little bit of mystery. Jesus is using this mystery, I think, to remind us that there's sometimes some, some things that God just does, and we don't know how it works. You ever look back on a season of your life, and you're like, I don't know how I walked through that. But God worked. I don't know how God put me in the place I'm at, but it worked. I don't know how God put my family back together, but it worked. I don't know how God uh, let me marry that person. I don't know how God took a dying church and brought it back to life, but he did. Sometimes God just works, and it's supernatural, and we don't know how. We just have faith to plant and grow. Are you with me? That's what Jesus is saying. Verse 28, all by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. A man scattered seeds. Seeds are pretty fascinating, actually. Um, the more I was preparing for this message and talking about these parables of plants and seeds, I started to look up uh, in on the internet machine, right, to find out about seeds, just so I was, was ready to go, um, and I kind of took me back, I knew a lot of this stuff, you'll probably know a lot of this stuff, but like to third grade, when I learned about plants and stuff, but it was so fascinating, I went, listen, let me read some of this, now don't fall asleep science time, but you get it, ready, when a seed comes to rest in an appropriate place with conditions suitable to its germination, it breaks open, the embryo inside the seed starts to grow into a seedling, roots grow down and anchor the plant into the ground. Roots also take up water and nutrients and store food. A shoot grows skyward and develops into a stem that carry water and nutrients from the roots to the rest of the plant. The stem also supports leaves so that they can collect sunlight. Leaves capture sunlight to make energy into the plant through the process of photosynthesis. Yeah, you remember some of this. When the seedling matures into an adult plant, it's ready to reproduce. It develops flowers. Flowers are special structures involved in reproduction. And then it kind of gets into some specifics that we're going to leave out of church for now, okay? Uh, we're going to skip ahead, right? The fertilization piece, right? After fertilization, this I found this so fascinating, the combined cell grows into an embryo inside of a new seed. The embryo is a tiny plant that has root, stem, and leaf parts ready to grow into a new plant when the conditions are right. It's all in there. It's all in there. When the conditions are right, you, you know God's put something inside of you? It's all in there already. And when the conditions are right, when you put yourself in the right place, when you put yourself in, around the right kind of people, when you begin to plant what God's put inside of you, you're going to grow. You don't know what God has in store for you. You know, unless you're a seed professional, that you really don't know what a seed's going to be, right? If I had a seed, if I was holding a seed, I'm not holding a seed, but you probably wouldn't be able to see it because you're far away, but if I was holding a seed and you had no context as to what the seed was, you know, where it came from, and you're not a seed professional, you probably wouldn't know what it's going to become, would you? No, you'd think, well, I don't know, it's a seed, you plant it, it could be corn, it could be watermelon, it could be a palm tree, it could be a cactus, it could be aloe, or any number of uh, millions of other plant species. You don't know until it's been planted and until it starts to grow. 
In the same way for us spiritually, I believe God puts different things inside of each and every one of us. There's different dreams and calls and visions. You don't know what your purpose is, what God has in store for you until you grow. Number two on your outline, fill this in. You won't know what God has in store for you until you go grow. You know, there could be somebody in this room and you're called to be the next Billy Graham. That might freak some of you out. You know, there may be some people called here today, and your purpose as you grow and develop is you're going to teach some young kids, and you're going to raise up the next Billy Graham. You don't know what God has in store for you. All you know is that if you grow, there is a purpose greater, because God's called us to greater things. And so you've got to plant those roots. See, I think there's a temptation a lot of times when people come to church, and they'll sing songs, and they'll interact with the presence of God, and they'll get fired up. Have you ever had that experience? You get warm fuzzies when you're in church, and you're just fired up, and God's speaking to your heart. Maybe he's putting something on your, your heart that you're going to work on, and you're all fired up, and there's a seed. You're like, hey, yeah, I feel like God's going to do something. And then you go home, and you put the seed on the shelf, and you go back to watching TV or Facebook, or you go back to doing the thing you used to do, right? You ever had that? Which is a temptation for us not to plant the seed, where we just stop at the seed. Don't stop at the seed. Tell your neighbor, don't stop at the seed. Wow, thanks for that. You're not helping me at all. Try it again. Don't stop at the seed. Yeah, you can't. Don't stop at the seed. God has more in store for you, whether it's a dream or a vision, or you just understand that you yourself are a seed. You're a seed that God wants to raise up. You can't stop at the seed. I'll tell you the story. Uh, I think you'll get it. I think it connects. It's about my wife, Julie, and I. Um, hopefully you like it. Whatever. We'll go for it. So before Julie and I got married, before, um, I'll just tell you how we, how we met. So I was working at a church. I was right out of college, and I was working at a church. And my wife, Julie, who was not my wife at the time, um, she happened to be an intern at this church, not in the same department as I was. Now, coming out of college, I was in this kind of uh, time and period in my life where I was really in like a sewing mode, where I really wanted to sew a good, healthy marriage, and so I was really not focused on dating. You know, you reap what you sow. We said that before, right? Right? You, you sow uh, uh, good relationships. You sow healthy marriage. You sow those things early on, and so I was in this kind of sewing period where I wasn't trying to date anybody. I wasn't trying to uh, I don't know. I was really focused on ministry. So everybody on the same page. Not trying to date, right? Okay. So I hung out with Julie a couple times in the context of work, and I kind of, I didn't even think anything uh, about her in a dating sense. And so I'm like, oh, yeah, she's cool and fun, whatever. She's going back to college. But not in a dating sense, right? Everybody clear on that? Just make sure we're clear on that. Okay. So we went, we had the opportunity to, uh, as, not as a couple, because we weren't dating, right? Um, uh, we, had, we had the opportunity to go as chaperones on a youth trip, and we're in the like waiting room to do one of the evening programs for this youth trip, and we're in like the prayer circle. You know about the prayer circles, right? You ever have been in a prayer circle? You're holding hands, you're in the prayer circle, everybody's going on praying, and you're like squinting and trying to keep focused on the prayer, right? And occasionally you, you peek and see how everybody else is doing. You, come on, we can be honest in church, you peek. Right? And everybody's trying to focus, but not sure. Right? Okay. So we're in that kind of a prayer circle, and I'm squinting. I'm trying to focus. I'm like, God, you're going to do work in these kids. And I'm focused on that. And I got this seed, if you will, from God. I felt like God spoke into my heart. Remember, at this point, I talked to Julie about four times, not in the context of dating. I happened to be standing next to Julie. We're holding hands. Again, not intentionally. All right? Promise. Not intentionally. I felt God, like, into my, in my heart. He's like, that's your wife. Exactly. So I'm like, you sure? I don't really know her. She's like way out of my league in general. Like, are you sure? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's your wife. And so I'm like, forget it. Get that out of my mind and focus on God moving in the kids. So we're trying to think. It, it just stays. Like 10 minutes. And like, I, I'm having this argument with God. No, that's, that can't be it. That can't be it. Finally, I said, fine, God. We're going to put some fleets out on the doorstep and see if you do it. At the end of this prayer, if she squeezes my hand, then I'll know it's from you. It's a seed. Now, I don't know if you know every now and again, if you're in a prayer circle, at the end of the prayer, some people are hand squeezers where they say, amen. And that's good. 
You know it's there, right? I'll be honest, I'm not a hand squeak and squeezer. I'm like, amen. All right, let's get out of there. Um, so I said, God, all right, if she squeezes my hand at the end of this prayer, then I'll know it's a seed from you. She squeezed it. <laughs> yeah. Now, here's the deal. That was a seed. All right? That was a seed. We didn't get married that day. And I didn't tell her that God told me she was going to be my wife. That would have been weird. She would have been like, all right, creepo, like this. No, no. It was a seed. I had to plant it. I had to sow. I had to pursue her. I had to spend time with her. I had to develop a relationship. Are you with me? Don't stop at the seed, all right? Don't stop at the seed. Because once you plant the seed, the seed in the soil, the seed can break open and it can start to grow roots. And roots are so important. Roots are what feed the plant when it's a baby plant. Roots are where they get the nutrients. Roots are what protect the plant as it starts to break up through the soil as a sprout. You know, this is springtime when lawnmowers are coming out and you're doing landscaping. Everybody's probably doing that kind of stuff. I actually don't mind mowing the lawn, but I, I hate landscaping specifically. I really, really, really hate to pull weeds. Anybody with me? Yeah, yeah, I, I hate it. But I remember early on, we're first trying to pull weeds it's my, my, at our house that we live in. I go out, and it was, I don't know why, maybe they're unique to my house or whatever, but those, those weeds that have the prickers sticking up out of the thing. And I remember I went and tried to, to get the weed, and I ripped it off, and I threw it out in the yard, and a couple places had those. And then I went to bed that night, and I came back in the morning, and that wizard weed was back. <laughs> and it had three friends with it. Why? Because I didn't get the fruit, right? A plant can, can withstand a whole lot of trauma if it has a good, strong root. Your roots are so important. You can't stop at the seed. You have to grow roots. Number three, on your outline. Number two, or three, yeah. In order to grow, you must plant roots. You must plant roots. You've got to begin to grow in your relationship with Christ. So what's that look like? It's you putting in the work uh, uh, on your personal discipline, spiritual growth. Every week on your outline at the front, we have a plan for spiritual growth. If you do this, you're going to grow roots. It's, it's simple. Read your Bible. Pray every day. You can't read your Bible every day and pray every day and not have God do a work in your heart. Read your Bible. Read it. There's power. There's life in there. He's going to grow you if you do it. Attend church regularly. This is so huge. So many people miss this. They're once a month and call that regular. No, 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 no. Be in church. We need this. We need to encourage one another. We need to be with one another. We need to just celebrate God together. Attend church regularly. You do it, you'll grow. Be in a small group. Be, have a God job. Serve the Lord. He'll do a work in you. And then learn to trust God in the area of your finances. If you do those things, you are going to grow roots. And the plant is only as strong as the roots. I want to show you this picture. This is a picture of a tree. It's a drawing of a tree and its roots. You see how deep the roots grow? If there's a real you know, tree, those, those roots, they get, they're all crooked and they grow big and out and far and down. And there is more root than there is actual tree. Now the leaves are a little deceptive, but there is more root. There is more under the ground. You almost see it like this. What you don't see is more important than what you do see. And your spiritual growth and your walk with Christ, if you want to grow into the purposes that God has for you, you have to plant roots. You have to spend the time that people don't see. And God does a work in there so that you can grow a strong foundation for what God wants to do in you. There's a storm that came through Enon a couple of weeks ago. Well, the whole area, but I live in Enon specifically. And... Uh, it was, it was actually a tornado. And I remember I came home. I was here at the church. I was doing some work and bad storm, hail. And so I was driving home. I was like, man, this is a bad storm. And um, as I'm pulling into my neighborhood, I noticed on the road leading up to my house, there are trees, like not just the one or two, but like six to seven. All in a row, these trees had fallen over. They've been uprooted. Actually, the roots were sticking up in the air. Giant trees down. Immediately, I'm like, oh, this is bad. There are power lines down. I'm like, I, th this looks like a tornado walk, walk, or came through here. It has to be what it is. And so I had to go around, 
um, a, to a different way to enter my neighborhood. And I came in, and by this time, I'm nervous, because you can just see. And where this, this path was, was like three doors down from my house. All right, so at this point, I'm a little bit worried. Of, you know, my kids and, my, and Julia are there. And so I kind of go in the house and run the door. I'm like, you guys okay? And they're like, yeah, why? <laughs> and I'm like, I think a tornado hit. And Julia's like, really? What, why? I'm like, there are trees down, like two doors down. There are trees down, like uprooted. I'm like, you didn't hear anything? She's like, no, the you know, weather station didn't say there was a tornado. And I'm like, Do, it was like really windy. I'm like, Do you think? And then she said, I saw this fog going across the thing. I'm like, you saw a fog? Was it spinning? Did a cow fly by? Was there a lady on a bike with a dog sticking out of the thing? Like, you told me to marry her, right? (laughs) So um, in the aftermath of this storm, we were okay by the grace of God. The kids were all right. It was cool. In the aftermath of this storm, though, we're looking at these trees, and you can see their roots. They had, like, actually picked up out of the ground. You can see where their roots had weakened, and they had fallen. Interesting thing about a tree, when it's planted or it grows or it's surrounded by things like houses and sidewalks and things like that, the roots have nothing to really grow onto, but a tree in the forest has a different experience. I want you to look at this picture. This is a picture of the root system. It's a depiction of the root system of the redwood forest. Those are those trees that are over a 1,000 feet high, the biggest trees in the world. Their roots don't only go down deep, they don't only go wide, but they grab on to the trees around them. They're only able to grow so strong because they link arms with their brothers and sisters. Part of growing roots is your personal walk with Christ, your personal discipleship. You have to nurture that, but then you have to plant roots within the body of Christ. Learn to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a trend. It's a dangerous trend that happens in churches where people will go to a church and they'll like the preaching or they'll like the children's ministry or they'll like the music and they'll interact. And so they'll stay at that church for three months or six months or maybe even a year. But then a conflict comes up and they get into an argument with somebody. So they take their ball and they take their family and they go to another church. And they like that church as well, right? You're going to like the church that has the Spirit of God there, right? And then they're going to interact with them and then there's going to be a conflict that happens. And then our argument that occurs and that do you see what happens you hop from church to church to church and you never plant roots if you are going to grow into God's purposes in your life you must plant roots we say this as a church a lot I don't care if you come to this church and plant roots but go to a church you love and plant church or plant roots all right through thick and thin plant roots It'll get messy sometimes because we're people. Where do you put seeds? You put them in the dirt. Can we all agree that we're all a little jacked up sometimes? We're all a little dirty sometimes, right? It's going to be a little bit of a mess. There's going to be a little bit of a struggle. But in that struggle, that's how God grows us and plants roots. And I promise you, if you are bound to your brothers and sisters in Christ, you can face any storm and stand. You don't know how often I've walked through a storm in my life, and it's through my brothers and sisters in this church that have carried me through. Don't miss that. Plant roots, grow deep. Don't stop at the seed. you got to plant roots. But don't stop at the roots. Say, don't stop at the roots. Don't stop at the roots. Can't stop at the roots because after the roots start to grow, then a sprout comes up and a stem get, you know, supports leaves and all that stuff that we talked about at the beginning. The stem is important, but the stem takes a while to develop because the plant's not fully grown yet. We don't even know what the plant is really when it's just a stem. We have to wait for it. You know, when you plant tomatoes in the spring and you have to wait a whole season in order to get there. I don't know about you, but I hate to wait for stuff. And I think it's really easy for us in our spiritual life to want to snap our fingers and get zapped and we're super Christian and not have to wait for God to develop within us and perseverance and stuff. We snap our fingers and that ministry that we thought God was calling to us, uh, calling us to all of a sudden comes to fruition or snap our fingers, our marriage is healed, snap our fingers. And our finances are in order. Snap our fingers. That addiction is taken care of. We want to hurry through. And I would just say you need to understand you can't stop at the stem. You're going to be tempted. It's going to be frustrating when you're in seasons of waiting. It may feel like God's distant. Maybe feel like God's not doing stuff. It's fast, but it's in those times you need to fall back on and understand that the times of waiting is when God does some of his best work in growth in us. Number four in your outline. Fill this in. 
God uses times of waiting to help us grow. Those dark moments, those quiet moments, those times when you feel like, oh man, I don't feel like reading my Bible again. If you do it, then God's going to work in you. Every time you open your Bible, God does a work. Every time you pray, God's going to do a work. Every time you interact with a small group, God's going to do a work, and especially in those times of waiting. There's a verse that says, those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. In the waiting is when we get some of our biggest times of strengthening, okay? So don't wish away those times of waiting, especially if you're a young person and you feel like God's calling you to this thing. Don't wish away the time of God developing that perseverance in your life. Don't stop at the seed. Don't stop at the root. And definitely don't stop at the stem because then what happens? We produce a flower. And it's beautiful, isn't it? When the flower comes out, that's a beautiful moment. We know what the tree is, or we know what the plant is. We, know what the, we finally know what the purpose is when the flower appears. And it's a beautiful thing, and it's a pretty thing, pretty flower. In our spiritual life, what happens is we've been growing and, and seeking God and planting roots, and eventually what happens, you start to settle into your purpose in life, or you start to settle in at least to an idea of what my, God might be calling you to, and you maybe you step in finally to financial freedom, or maybe you step finally into your marriage is in a good place, or you finally experience peace after working through this relationship with God, or you finally step into this ministry that you feel called to, or this job, or whatever the case may be, and it's a pretty flower. You finally worked out that sin in your life. It's a pretty flower. Everybody say pretty. pretty. Now here's the thing you got to know because you don't stop at the seed. You don't stop at the root. You don't stop at the stem. But this is the most important part, of this important part of this message. And you get this down here. You definitely, definitely, definitely do not stop at the flower because the flower is not the fruit. Pretty is not the purpose. Tell your neighbor, pretty's not your purpose. <laughs> pretty's not your purpose. It's not just looking good. It's not like we're going to stand before God one day and say, I got my kids in order, I got my family in order, I followed all your rules, are we good? Jesus is going to say, what about all the people you stepped over to get here? What about all the sheep that are still hurting? What about all this over here? Your purpose is not to just look good. Your purpose isn't just success. Your purpose isn't just financial freedom. You better believe that God has more than just putting your family back together. That's a springboard for God's purpose in your life. His purposes are greater. Pretty is not your purpose. There's so much more. There's so much more. I don't want us to miss. I don't want us to stop at, at that idea that we just, okay, we got, you know, there was people in the Bible who did this very thing, who they got all the, their life in order. They got the, the ministry they wanted. They got the success they wanted. They got the status they wanted. And they were so good at following God's laws. They did them all. You know who they were? The Pharisees. And they killed Jesus. Pretty's not your purpose. Jesus in Mark chapter 11, he's walking with his disciples and they come upon a fig tree, and the fig tree is alive, and it's there, and it has flowers. It's a beautiful fig tree, but it doesn't have any figs. There's no fruit. Jesus looks at the tree and curses the tree, and the tree dies. He used it as an analogy for his disciples. He says, the flower is not the fruit. There's still something more. This is a fig tree. Its purpose isn't just to look good. Its purpose is to produce fruit, figs. Jesus tells his disciples this in John chapter 15, this huge verse. Let me read a couple pieces of this. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will, what's it say? Bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This is to my Father's glory, that you will bear much fruit. Showing yourselves to be my disciples. You want to know if you're a disciple of God, you're going to bear fruit. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. The flower isn't the fruit. Don't stop at the flower. Pretty is not your purpose. You're called to bear much fruit. The flower is an important thing. Let's not forget that, so don't feel weird if you got flowers. I looked around the room. There's a lot of pretty flowers in this place. 
don't stop there. I don't know where you're at on your spiritual journey. Maybe you're still in seed mode. Where you're, maybe first time. God, you need to hear, God loves you. He has a plan and purpose for you, but the only way you're going to grow is if you plant it and you begin to sow it. But maybe you're all in the, in the root stage. Keep going. Don't stop. Maybe you're in the stem stage and you're a little bit of a dark place. Maybe here, be reminded, be encouraged. God's got stuff in store for you. Don't stop. But if you're at the flower stage, you finally got that peace. You finally got that position. You find, Don't stop. Because that's not the fruit. The fruit is when other people see your flower and they start to ask, how did your marriage get put back together? I don't know. I don't know how it works, but I know Jesus, and Jesus just put it back together. You should meet him. Or when your coworker says, hey, how, how are you walking through this thing with the joy that you have? He said, because I know Jesus. I don't know how he works, but he's grown in me. That's fruit. That's a seed. When you interact with the world around you, you take uh, the gospel of who God is, the love of Jesus, and you tell people about him. That's our purpose. That's your purpose. Everything else is just a flower. So don't stop at the flower. Don't stop. And God's going to do a work in you, and God's going to do, continue to do a work in our church. This brings us to, let me just, we'll end here with this idea. In our church, we've seen this firsthand. God taking seeds growing them up into spiritually mature Christians who reach out and they get more seeds. And as us, as a collective, we've actually, you could call us as a church, we're a seed. We're, we started as a dying church. We started to plant roots. And people started to come. And we started to grow deeper roots. We grew a stem and more people started to come. And at one point, we were 70 people the 13 years ago or whatever, just a seed. And you fast forward a seed. God move has moved in this place and moved in this place to where we're at today. We're kind of a flower today. We got almost a thousand people that come and worship on a regular basis. That's a that's a pretty pretty flower, right? Like that's awesome. How, how did that happen? I don't I don't know. We just planted seeds and God grew it, right? We're in a, we're in a, what I would call a flower. We got a beautiful building. We got awesome songs that we sing. A lot of people coming you need to hear, don't stop at the flower. For us as a church, we are not going to stop at the flower. So many churches get to a place in their growth where, they, oh, we built the building, it looks good, we're going to stop. Church, we will not stop at the flower. We are not going to stand before God one day at the end of time and say, look at the building we built, didn't we sing awesome songs, and have Jesus say, look at the community around you that was still dying and you didn't do anything. So many churches get into this, this idea where, oh, it's all good inside, and they pray for God from a distance to do a work in their community. God, please help those people who are hurting. God, please help these marriages. God, please help these who are hungry. God, please help these people who are struggling for addiction, and they don't do anything. They stop at the flower. For us as a church, we will not stop at the flower. We're not going to just pray for God to do a work in the problem of addiction in the Dayton area. You know this is a problem. It's not just a little bit of a problem. Day after day after day, people are dying. Just this week, just the other day, I heard a report about a baby who was one years old, had heroin in their system, had to be revived with Narcan. Day after day after day. This is an issue, and we are not going to stand before God and say, we prayed for it and didn't do anything. We're not going to just pray that God would make a difference, but we're going to hear God from heaven say, I did do something to make a difference. I planted the seed that is Medway Church in this area, and I raised it up to a beautiful flower so it can produce seeds and it can impact the world around them. And church, we will do that. We are going to impact the world around us. We're going to take the gospel to the people that need it. We're going to take food to the people that need it. We're going to help people who are struggling with addiction. Why? Because we're going to do greater things than Jesus did because his Holy Spirit is inside of us. His Holy Spirit. Because we serve a God that's not intimidated by addiction, that's not intimidated by your problems, by not, is not intimidated by your kids' problems, it's not intimidated by your marriage problems. He's not intimidated by death. He conquered the grave. And so we will be a light on the hill and we will take back what the devil stole. 
Don't stop at the seed. Don't stop at the root. Don't stop at the stem. Definitely don't stop at the flower. God has more in store for you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you. I pray that you would make us a people that don't stop. No matter where we are in our journey, whether we're in seed stage or root stage or stem stage, would you encourage us through your spirit, challenge us, poke us, prod us to continue and not to stop growing, not to stop seeing your purposes revealed, because we know that if we will do that in as individuals collectively, God, that you will do a work in this place to help us have an impact on the world around us. May we not sit idly by while the world dies around us. God, make us a light. Make us the place that people call home and hope and point to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to end a little differently this morning. We're going to have, still have prayer partners at the front. Go ahead and stand. We'll have prayer partners up at the front when we conclude. If you need to pray for any reason, come and pray. We would love to pray with you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read a benediction, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. I'm going to read a benediction, and at the end of this, I'll say amen, and that's when we will dismiss, okay? I'm going to ask you, go ahead, bow your head, close your eyes, hear this benediction, okay? For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask and all we imagine according to his power that's at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I love you, church. God bless you.